Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you this evening for a blessed presence that's already in our midst. Because we have gathered in the name of your dear Son and our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you Lord for the presence of your Holy Spirit which is already here to teach us and lead us into all truth. Thank you Lord for the Holy Word. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the holy company of your people. And thank you for your holy presence. We pray with God the meditation of our hearts and the words of my mouth this evening be found acceptable and pleasing in your sight. For us is prayer in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Praise God for bringing us to the last but one teaching session of this um, week-long revival program of the Brother of Life Fellowship of Oman here in Muscat. I once again want to thank God for giving me the privilege of bringing God's word to you to congregation like yours with so much of earnestness and seriousness, hunger and thirst and intense desire. Someone asked, does God speak today? The answer is an emphatic yes. God does speak today if there is someone to listen to him. And we know that God has been speaking to us throughout this week. And as I met with some of you when I visited your homes for hospitality or met with you on different occasions, I was overwhelmed to hear from you that you already feel that you have more than what you could take and you need to do a lot of uh, chewing the cut after the meeting comes to a close. I believe that with that homework, all these lessons will be of immense blessing to you and you will not just stop being like the Christian in Thessalonica but you will become like the Christians in Berea. The Christians in Thessalonica, they received the word with all gladness and readiness of mind, but they stopped there. Whereas the Christians in Berea, they received the word and searched the scriptures daily to find if things were so. And the biblical record says, they were more noble or they were nobler than the Christians in Thessalonica. So I believe, dearly beloved, your work begins from Saturday because my work gets over on Friday. Go on with God, you will see. The more pain and effort and labor and if necessary, tears or knees you put into your study of God's word. God will bless you with not just treasures, but as his word says, hidden treasures. You just walk across the banks of the river or walk across the shore of the sea, you get only pebbles. If you want pearls, you must go for deep sea diving. Don't be satisfied with the pebbles, however rounded they might be, however colorful they might be, their value is limited. Go for deep sea, dive, deep sea diving where you will get pearls from God's word. On the first day, that was last Friday, I spoke to you about worship, speaking to you on the other side of worship. And next day I spoke to you about the other side of guidance. And then on the third teaching session, I spoke to you on spiritual warfare. I spoke to you how you can overcome evil spirits and I pinpointed five main and predominant and very active, if necessary, hyperactive evil spirits in the lives of believers worldwide. And yesterday we studied another important subject that was on relationships. I gave you some don'ts if you want to improve upon interpersonal relationship. Now these topics are fundamental but they are foundational. They are not just foundational doctrines, but they are foundational teaching to build us up and bring us 
into maturity, growing into the head until we come to the full stature of the very Son of God. That is God's purpose for each of us as organs or members of the total body of Christ. Today I have again chosen somehow the Lord as I was wait, waiting in his presence as to the topics that I should choose to speak to you. He has been burdening me again and again on these foundational aspects. So this evening I have another foundational subject with me. That is Christian obedience. Christian obedience. Christian life begins with obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is why unbelievers are called children of disobedience. Turn with me to the book of Ephesians. I look at the second chapter and I will read to you the second verse. In which you once walked according to the course or the ways of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So if unbelievers are called the sons of disobedience, Christians or believers are to walk as children of obedience. In other words, that which would characterize the Christian life would be a spirit of obedience, an attitude of obedience throughout, not occasional spasmodic obedience to some selected guidance and commandments of God, but a spirit of obedience. I underline that word spirit of, attitude of. So obedience should become the very way of life, the very nature of our character. But when obedience becomes such an all-important aspect of Christian life, the devil will then primarily target it. Anything that is important attracts him. You should never forget it. If the devil attacks something, that means that particular subject has attracted him and that has disturbed him. We should always understand that spiritual truth. Because obedience is all the more so important in Christian life, he started disturbing us by injecting into our veins and streams some lies which he has very successfully employed from time immemorial. You know what he would say? There is no point in trying to live an obedient life before God because God is a hard taskmaster. He expects and demands simply too much. He doesn't understand our struggles. That's what the single talented man said. Why did you bury your talent? His first argument was, I know you are a hard man. The devil injects into our minds a kind of a concept that God's commandments are too high to be attained or obeyed. That is why Jesus Christ came with an emphatic correction. All you labor and are heavy laden, not with sin, but with rules and regulations and legalism, you come to me, I will give you rest, take my yoke upon you, because my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. It is called a burden, but it is a light burden. Are you able to appreciate it? It is a yoke, but it is an easy yoke. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. Now in that particular call of Jesus, what is to be emphasized is mine. You know why we should emphasize that word my there? Because that is against the backdrop and background of the law that was given by Moses. The Bible says in first John's Gospel, first chapter and 17th words, turn with me. I have just begun to build 
a strong foundation for the superstructure of this message. So come along with me very carefully. Don't miss even the link sentences. John 1.17 The law was given through Moses. But. Why is there the word but? That conjunction introduced there. Because here is a drastic dispensational change or a shift. The law was given through Moses. But. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now the Jewish audience which was listening to the call of Jesus Christ understood. Come unto me, I will give you rest. The yoke of Moses has been too much for you. It was so much that even your leaders will not touch it even with their fingers. So you come unto me. Better we have an exchange. You take my yoke. Now you have been yoked and burdened by the laws that were given through Moses, but now you take my yoke. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Someone took that very seriously. And he became the beloved disciple whose name was John. He walked with Jesus, obeying his commandments, not just for 10 years, not for 20 years, not just for 30 years, but for 60 plus long years. He started following Jesus Christ when he was in his 30s. And he kept following the Lord Jesus Christ closely for 60 plus years. And when he was writing his epistle, 1 John, 2 John and 3 John, when he was 90 plus, he said, If we love God, we will obey his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Hallelujah. If a new believer who has committed his life to Christ makes that statement, you can say, yes, yes, this is the result of initial excitement and enthusiasm. But here is a man who has walked with God in implicit obedience for six decades plus, who was able to say, his commandments are not burdensome. Now when we say that, we are not to mean that God has in the New Testament because of the advent of the Lord Jesus Christ, in any sense, He has lowered the standard of expectation of the walk of righteousness and holiness. Follow me carefully. Because today I am striking a kind of a chord that separates the New Testament from the Old. Just because we have that word but in John 1 17, law through Moses, but grace and mercy through Jesus, that does not mean that God has lowered the standard. In fact, God has raised the standard. In the Old Testament, it says, do not commit adultery. But in the New Testament, Jesus said, I say to you, don't even look at a woman adulterously. Even if you look at a woman lustfully, you have already committed adultery with her in your heart. So Jesus by his coming did not slacken the demands of God, lower the standards of God's holiness, rather he raised them. You don't need to actually stab a man to death. Even if you hate a man, you are a murderer of man and worthy of judgment. Then what is the difference? Why did Jesus say that my yoke is easy and my burden is light? Did he come as a threat to the laws of Moses? Or a competition to the expectations of his father? So he could become greater among the three persons of Trinity? Was there an internal rivalry among the three persons of the blessed Trinity? No. When we say that grace and truth came through the Lord Jesus Christ, and his yoke is easy and his burden is light. That God's standard of holiness is always the same. But when we come to Christ, there is implanted in our heart God's grace to obey God's commandments. Grace is nothing but God's enablement 
to make us obey the commandments of God. Please understand it properly. This is how you can understand the Old Testament in the light of the New Testament. One is not contradicting the other. The New Testament was concealed in the Old Testament and the Old Testament is revealed in the New Testament. God speaks to us through these two lips, Old Testament and New Testament. I want to speak to you today along the same theme. How has God made obedience easy for us? That is the topic of this evening. How to make obedience easy. In order to answer this question, I have chosen a book which is normally considered to be difficult to understand in the New Testament, that is the book of Hebrews. For reasons that we cannot understand, even the author is unknown, but the truths presented there are not unknown. Some people say that Paul must have been the writer of the book of Hebrews and others prescribe it to, ascribe it to Stephen and there are people who ascribe it to even Barnabas. But I for one who would say that the author of the book of Hebrews is unknown. When the Bible is silent, I want to be silent and I would not argue from silence. That's how I take the Bible. So this author of the book of Hebrews was addressing who? Hebrews. Isn't it? Hebrews. Hebrews meant the Jewish nation. That means people who were thorough and true with the laws of Moses. So someone who thoroughly understood the demands and teachings of the Old Testament scriptures, that was his audience. And very interestingly, even though there are so many subjects which are so vividly and widely developed all through these 13 chapters, 13, 14 chapters of the book of Hebrews, I have come to understand that the dominant theme of the book of Hebrews is obedience. The very first verse begins like that. Keep your Bibles open to the book of Hebrews. This is a kind of a book study under one title. God who at various times in different ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. Here is God speaking. Second chapter, first word. Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard. Lest we drift away. This is our response. So you find, you read through the entire book of Hebrews at one stretch. You'll find that the dominant theme is obedience. Now you should not start reading any book in the New Testament by just spending too much time on verse 1 and then verse 2 and then verse 3. No, that is not how you should study the New Testament epistle. First give a through reading from chapter 1 to the last chapter of that particular book. And just close your Bible and see whether some theme has gripped your mind. If still you are not clear about it, read through it again. First you say you are going to Muscat. Then you say you are going to Ruby. And then you say this is block number that. And then you say it is that house. And then you say this is this street. And then you just open that house. So you go step by step. You say the country. You say the region. You say the street. You say the block. And you say the flat. And then you say which floor. You go step by step. This is how we understand the New Testament epistles. From this book of Hebrews, I have selected seven helps for obedience to be made easy. Not that I found eight and I squeezed it into seven. Not that I found six and I expanded it to seven. Normally, most of the biblical truths fall into this rainbow of seven. Normally. The Bible has got a structural beauty. So many things are uh, multiples of seven in the Bible. If you study scripture numerics, that makes a very interesting study. Now because I am basically an engineer with mathematics as my language, I find these numerics very helpful. 
So hope you are putting up with me. Seven factors which make obedience easy from the book of Hebrews. Number one, very simple. Anyone can immediately give the answer, faith. The first help that God has given us so we could obey him is an enablement to believe, faith. If we trust someone, beloved, it becomes easy for us to do what that person bids us to do. Is that right? 11th chapter is the hall of fame of the heroes of faith. We all know that. Book of Hebrews, 11th chapter is the faith chapter. And there we meet some champions of whom the one who stands out is Abraham. We read about him in the 8th words. By faith, Abraham obeyed. By faith, Abraham obeyed. That's what I said. Faith is the first help that God gives us to lead us in the path of obedience. How did he trust God? He trusted God as a friend. Come with me to the book of James. Look at the second chapter. And I will read to you verse 23. The scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Will you please complete that words with me? And he was called the friend of God. Friends, I want to tell you something to encourage you this evening so you will continue to have this pursuit of a life of obedience to please Jehovah. Jesus came not only to reveal to us the fatherhood of God, he also came to teach us the friendliness of God. I want to encourage you. Abraham was called the friend of God. Jesus Christ, in all his ministry, gave a lot of emphasis for this aspect of friendliness with God. You know, sometimes when we say fellowship with God, it has got a very high religious connotation. It's a very, it's an overtone fellowship. You know, very high theological sounding word. But basically, it is friendliness. Friend of God. That is why the Lord Jesus Christ got a nickname from people. Friend of sinners. Whether or not you earn any other title, you may or may not earn the title of a doctorate, but you better earn this title before you breathe last. Friend of So on your tomb should be epitomized. Here lies a friend of Amen <laughs> Friend of sinners He was not only a friend of sinners He was a friend of saints also He called his disciples And you know what he told them I will not call you my servants You are my friends if you are my servants, I will simply be ordering you. You are not just my servants, you are my friends. Friendship means opening up your heart, not just narrating the facts, but sharing the feelings. I call you friends. There was a young man he fell in love with a beautiful lady and he wanted to marry her but just before marriage she died of a disease. He fell in love with her, again with another woman. The day of marriage was approaching and she had to travel across a huge lake to come to a place where the wedding will be solemnized. Something happened. Her boat sank and she died. This man immediately sat in his study and wrote a song. 
What a friend we have in Jesus. You may wonder who wrote this song. A man who lost last two of his fiancées, he wrote this song. His mother was worrying and wondering as to what comfort he, she would send to her son who has met with such tragic experiences before a, otherwise possibly a blissful marriage. And before that mother would pen a few words of comfort, this song reached the mother's table from her son. And that has become one of the top ten songs of the world. Amen. What a friend we have in Jesus. When we are able to take God at his word, trusting him as a friend, you said it, so I do it. Somebody said, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Yes, yes. These are some of the dictums which I have pounded into my head. You will bring forth a son. How come? I know not a husband. What that be born of you shall be called the son of the highest. The Holy Ghost shall come upon you. The power of the highest shall overshadow you. You think a virgin understood it? You think any virgin can understand it? You know what she said? Be it unto me according to your word. All night miling and toiling but catching nothing. Jesus came. <laughs> and he told Peter, Peter, please throw the net on the right side. As if he was so long putting on the wrong side. <laughs> throw the net on the right side. <laughs> Peter would have laughed within himself. I am an expert fisherman from my childhood. Here comes after all a carpenter. He can make a boat, but he cannot sail a boat for fishing. A carpenter is telling a fisherman to throw the net on the right side, as if I was doing it on the wrong side. You know what he said? Whole night we were, you know, there is an argument. If you look at that passage, there is an argument. Whole night we were toiling and moiling. Nevertheless, because you are saying, you understand? And I'm paraphrasing that passage. Nevertheless, at your word, I will throw the net. Disobedience is a direct result of distrust. As much as obedience is an inevitable evidence and outcome of simple faith. Obedience becomes difficult once the heart is hardened by unbelief. That is why in the third chapter, 12th verse, if I don't give the name of the book, that means I'm referring to the book of Hebrews. And I assume you have kept the book of Hebrews open with a bookmark or a ribbon, whatever. 12th verse of the third chapter. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Faith makes obedience easy. The second help God has provided for us to make obedience easy is fear. Fear. 11th chapter, 7th verse. 11th chapter, 7th verse. 11th chapter of what? Okay. 11th chapter, 7th verse. By faith, be Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, Moved with godly fear. Underline or encircle the word fear. And he prepared the ark for the saving of his household. By which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness. Which is according to faith. Noah feared God. What did he fear? If I don't obey what God has said. Then there would be floods and a deluge and I would be destroyed. He was afraid. Fear has got two components. One is negative fear and the other is positive fear. You know what is the negative fear? It's a fear of punishment. If I don't do it, I will reap the consequence. But you know what is the positive fear? 
it is fear for the person reverence one is mindful of the consequence and the other is mindful of the reverence we need to have both negative fear as well as positive fear we will begin with negative fear then i want to explain to you the positive fear the first lessons of obedience are learned in the school of negative fear god told adam don't eat that fruit if you eat you will die so there is a threat there is a punishment that is proclaimed and parents of ch- tell, telling the children if i don't do if you don't do it i will kick you and teachers are telling the students if you don't study well you will not pass so it's a negative fear you remind the person of the punishment and the consequence i think we christians have by and large lost this fear because hell is no more believed to be a literal punishment a few years ago i was addressing the theological college students of a very leading bible college in india and after giving them perhaps the final session i spoke to them for three days after giving them the final session the final lecture some students met with me and one of them who was already ordained as a priest in the church in south india and he had come there to his master's degree in divinity and he asked me a question you know what that question was dear brother do you believe there is a literal hell my immediate question was in my heart why the hell did he come to the college <laughs> then i asked him why do you ask this question he said when we entered this college i believed there was a literal hell but after listening to some of our professors i begin to wonder whether there is a literal hell i'm sorry anan i've really shaken up brothers and sisters the bible says the fear of god enables you to distance yourself from all that is evil turn with me to book of ecclesiastes and look at the 12th chapter these are lessons you should teach your children also very important lessons the last concluding sentences of the writings of this preacher of preachers ecclesiastes chapter 12 verses 13 and 14 let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter please read with me yes you are you are you are you're trying to find out the preacher of preachers have you got him have you found him keep on seeking you'll find yes let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter ah read me read with me fear god and keep his commandments you understand fear god so that helps you to keep the commandments of god even though it is a negative fear and this is the whole duty of man and he says in verse 14 for god will bring every work into judgment including every secret thing whether it is good or whether it is evil the punishment we never outlive the need for this fear of god or fear for god why is it there so much of corruption in societies today you go to abraham he would answer Abraham why did you say that she is your sister and not your spouse king abimelech he comes to abraham and say why did you cheat me like this i was about to commit a sin but god prevented but why did you do this unto me and the patriarch answered i know there is no fear of god in this place and i was afraid they will kill me and take my wife that was the answer he gave so it is the fear of god that prevents corruption in a society brothers and sisters if you look at chapter 4 and verse 13 
There is a tremendous truth that we should perhaps frame as a wall text and hang it at the entrance and exit of our homes. 413, there is no creature hidden from his sight. All things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. It was this fear for God which made young Joseph to run away from temptation. Amen. She said, nobody is there around in this house. We can securely fasten the lock of the door. But he said, you woman, you look around, but I have the habit of looking above. I worship a God who sees me. His penetrating eyes will see through. Not He doesn't need a keyhole to see through, but he can see. Because my God not only dwells light, he also dwells in darkness. Darkness is light to him. Amen? Amen. I'm bringing lots of theological truths into this understanding of this all-important truth. God who is in darkness. Now there are cameras which can take pictures in darkness. <laughs> How much more? The seven eyes of God. You know, the Bible, when it says seven eyes, it means nothing is beyond God's sight. That's the meaning. Every disobedience will be punished. That is negative fear. Then there is positive fear also. Understanding who commands us makes obedience easy. Follow me carefully. Understanding who commands us makes obedience easy. Can anyone tell me the first of the Ten Commandments? Anyone? Huh? Say the first commandment. Huh? Huh? I am the Lord thy God. That's where it begins. That is the prelude for the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt and thou shalt not all come later. The reason why thou shalt and the reason why thou shalt not is because I am the Lord your God. You understand? That was thundered on the ears of the first hearers. Not only in Exodus 20th chapter, verse 2, where we have that statement. Later on, when the Ten commands, Commandments were amplified and expanded into practical rules and regulations, in the other Pentateuchal books of Moses, for example, book of Leviticus, 19th chapter and 10th verse, Book of Leviticus, 19th chapter and 10th verse. You shall not glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather every grape of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. And read further on. I am the Lord. <laughs> Here is an instruction. To leave something, you know, don't uh, cut off and crop everything. Leave certain things, glean certain, leave certain things without gleaning for the poor and the stranger. Why? Fourteenth words of the same chapter, 1914. You shall not curse the deaf, nor put the stumbling block before the blind, but shall fear your God. Read it. Are you with me? 16th verse. You shall not go about as a tent bearer among your people, nor shall you take a stand against the life of your neighbor. Read. You understand why you should obey God? You understand why you should not do these things? One more example. 18th verse. 
You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. This is only sample passages. Everywhere. That was the logic. Because beyond that, there is no appeal, isn't it? Why should I do it? Because God has said it. I am the Lord your God. I am not just God, I am the Lord your God. You are Lord, you are master. You are under my mastery. You are under my management. You are under my lordship. I think that's a ghost. No, 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 no. It is not a ghost. Be not afraid. It is I, said Jesus, while he was walking on water. And Peter immediately said, if it is you, Lord, ask me to come, I will walk on water. Amen? Amen. Anybody else ask you to jump on water, you better not jump. His logic was, if Jesus asked me to jump on water and walk on it, I can, I will. It's worth taking the risk. Are you with me? If it is you, Lord, I will come. But, not here, but in India sometimes, we don't have this attitude. Telephone rings. Whether or not we know who calls us, we run and rush to the telephone, whatever we are doing, only to find it is a wrong number. <laughs> so who calls? It is Jesus. It is the Lord your God. We'll obey him. This is what I call the help of fear in obeying God. First faith, next fear. The third help God has given to us to obey him is facts. F-A-C-T-S, facts. You know, often we are told that we must obey God blindly. But I believe... God would have us understand why we must obey. Our obedience must be immediate, yes. Our obedience must be implicit, yes. But I believe our obedience must be intelligent also. Look at the third chapter. Third chapter of? Very alert. Third chapter, reading from verse 5 to 7. Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end, therefore, encircle the word therefore, Two facts are served here, two examples are presented here, and a conclusion is drawn here. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Moses obeyed God as a servant. Jesus obeyed his father as a son. Therefore, we are to obey God as his children. That is the logic that is presented and developed there. Friends, when we understand that God is our creator, we will obey him as his creature. When we know God is our father, we will obey him as his children. If I am your father, where is my honor? God asked the people of God through Malachi. If Christ is our king, we will obey him as the citizens of the kingdom. If Christ is our captain, we'll obey him as his soldiers. If Christ is our Lord and Master, we'll obey him as his subjects. That is why Jesus said, you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I ask you to do. That's a contradiction. And if Christ is the head of the body, we'll obey him as the organs of the body. And if Christ is the teacher, we'll obey him as his disciples. Why we do what we do makes obedience intelligent. That is why David prayed in 119th chapter, don't ask me which book, 34th verse, this is what he prayed. 
34th words of the 119th chapter give me understanding and i shall keep your law he is asking for understanding he is asking for intelligence he asked the lord please give me an understanding so i may obey you and also 73rd verse 73rd words the latter portion give me understanding that i may learn to obey your commandments and 125th words i am your servant give me understanding you know, i have just picked up some sample text but you will find david constantly making this prayer lord give me understanding so i may obey your word it is not blind obedience i would call it brilliant obedience not blind obedience but brilliant obedience why not god doesn't call us to remove our mind when we offer ourselves to him he only calls us to renew our mind but sometimes christianity has got it all wrong the christianity thinks that there should be no place for thinking in christian life there was a great saint and a christian philosopher you know what he said the problem with modern christians is that they cannot think they cannot think it is not removal of our minds beloved it is the renewal of our minds don't be like horses and donkeys who do not have understand you want to look at that verse turn with me to psalm 32 and that is in the matter of guidance and obedience psalm 32 look at verses 8 to 9 i will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go i will guide you with my eye don't be like the hearts or like the mule which have no understand you ask them to come they will come you ask them to go they will go you ask them to stand it will stop and you ask them to lie down they will lie down but they don't know why they do what they do. don't be like that the bible says we must have an understanding how do we get this understanding i believe that understanding comes through various means but primarily i believe as you all will agree this understanding for obedience comes through repeated meditation of god's word it's not meditation of god's word repeated meditation of god's word mark my words which i have deliberately chosen not just to be verbose in all that i speak but to make you understand you would have found in all my messages in all the talks that i delivered to you i gave a lot of logic i reasoned out i myself raised questions it is not imposing something blindly upon you this is it you do it no it make you understand why you do what you do that way you will do it better and you will do it longer otherwise it will be only an attack of obedience you know some people have attacks of obedience now and then they get an attack then they will obey god then forget about it but if you understand why you obey god then it becomes a way of life with you your mind gets tuned up to it it becomes part of your being it becomes easy you know we are talking about making obedience easy repeated meditation of god's word because the word of god is a two edged sword and nothing is hidden from its sight which means it is all plain facts nothing but facts true and absolutely absolute truth perfection of perfection complete completeness we have in the revelation of god's word no compromise whatsoever that is why 
Whenever someone wants to go for uh, the 10 days or 30 days or 40 days of fasting, I invariably tell those people, if only I'm able to meet with them. Spend 51% of your time in the meditation of God's word and limit your prayer to only 49%. It is better to hear than to speak. Let your words be few. God is in heaven, you are on the earth. Let your words be few. You better approach to hear than to speak. Be slow to speak and be swift to hear. As much as you, medi you, you saturate yourself with the meditation of God's word, to that extent only, your life of obedience will be fragrant. It will be opening up as the petals of a flower opening up. At sunrise helps for obedience number one faith number two fear number three facts and number four fellowship fellowship third chapter reading from 12 to 15 third chapter reading from 12 to 15 Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Verse 15 again speaks about hardening of our hearts as in the day of rebellion. Exhort one another daily while it is called today. What is the meaning while it is called today? Yet, why do we call today today? Because there is a tomorrow and there was a yesterday. When there will not be a tomorrow, there is no meaning for the word today, right? A day will come when there will be no tomorrow. That is the last day of the earth. When eternity will usher in, until that day, you exhort one another daily. Hallelujah. Until that day, you exhort one another daily. Help and support from our fellow believers make obedience easy. When did God give Eve to Adam? A fundamental question, Sunday class question. When did God give Eve to Adam? Hmm? When? Immediately after giving Adam a commandment. You read that passage carefully. You don't need to turn to that passage. You ought to know it. This is a time when you ought to be teachers where someone has to give you milk again. Immediately after giving him a commandment about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God gave Adam this woman. Sometimes we think God gave Eve to Adam so that Adam will not fall into adultery. Where was a woman to fall into adultery? Another woman. There was no other woman. So it was not that he would not fall into adultery. It was to help Adam to obey the commandments of God. It was to play a supportive role for Adam to walk in the way of obedience. It is positive. It is not negative. It is not that he might not fall into sin, but in order that he might always be pleasing his creator, God. If you look at the 11th chapter, there again we read about a woman. If you would call Abraham as the patriarch, I would like to call Sarah as the matriarch. 11th chapter, reading from 8 to 11. Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would afterward receive as an inheritance, etc., etc. And 11, 11. 11, 11. Easy to remember. You know that 11, 11, it, it stands as a companion. One by one and one by one. It's a companionship. Easy to remember the scripture references. By faith, Sarah also, 
I have heard some people, some Bible teachers uh, interpreting the passage like this. Abraham got up early in the morning and he went out because if he had not got up early in the morning, Sarah would have stopped him. What an anemic interpretation. No. Because they had to go on such a long distance, in the Mediterranean climate, it was only logical that you start your journey in the early hours of the day. Because the Bible says, Sarah herself also. So Sarah was very much partnering with Abraham in his walk of implicit obedience to the call and commandment of God. Children, all of you children stand up. Children below 18 years, all of you stand up. 18 and below, all teenagers, children, you all stand up. You know why God has given you parents? You listen to me, I'm talking to you. You know why God has given you parents? Not just to be strict with you. Not just to make you provisions. That is all secondary. I want to tell you. The reason why I have made you to stand up here is that this will be implanted in your hearts and this will be passing on from generation to generation. God has given you pain so that, that they can help you to obey God. Amen. Your parents are your supporters in your work of obedience to God. Because this is the greatest duty that is on every man and every woman. So all of you children, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm not a preacher speaking to you, I'm your uncle now speaking to you. That your parents, every time you look at your mother, every time you look at your father, remember, they are your supporters to help you please God in all that you do. Without them, you are lost. And you are deceived. The greatest tragedy of deception is that the deceived person will not know that he is deceived. That is what deception is. God has given you wonderful papers. See, every time they say no, believe that is a word of blessing that comes from them. Every time they say no, it will be difficult for you to digest. But you accept it and you will find. Because no one else loves you as your parents. No one, no one else truly loves you as your parents. Anybody else will speak sweet things and they will dig a pit for you. But not your parents. You can trust your parents. God bless you. Will you do it? Will you do it, children? Please sit down. I want to just read a passage to you all. Proverbs first chapter. And read verses 7 and 8. Children, you all look at the Bibles. If you have not brought your Bibles, please share the Bibles from your neighbors. And say it for yourself. And next time when you come to church, bring a Bible. There are even kids' Bibles available. Seven and eight of Proverbs. My son, my daughter, hear the instruction of your father and do not forsake the law of your mother. Father will instruct, mother will give a law. Mother is sometimes more strict than father. <laughs> so it is already there. The Bible itself says it. Fathers give instructions, but mothers only give laws. But they will be graceful ornaments on your head and chains about your neck. All the children say hallelujah. Children, hallelujah. They are hair clips of Diamonds, they are chains of costly gold around your neck. What? The instruction of your father, the guidelines of your father, and the law and the teaching of your mother. There are many young people here. 18 to 25, will you please stand up? 18 to 25, 18 to 30. No, 18 to 30, you're afraid that I will tell you something. <laughs> yes, get up. How much time you 
you guess it did? My dear young people, you need the help of godly friends. You know why? Take your Bibles. You keep standing and take your Bibles to the book of Ecclesiastes. Again, you know the book of Ecclesiastes is written by the wisest man who ever lived. Wisdom was always associated with that man. Ecclesiastes, fourth chapter, I'll read to you verse 9. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. If they fall, one will lift up his friend. But what to him who is alone when he falls, he has no one to help him up. And it says in verse 13, this is a special message by young people. Better is a poor and wise youth than an old and foolish king who will be admonished no more. In your choice of friends, please be extremely careful and cautious to choose someone who, when you go wrong, will be able to say, you are wrong, friend, you have to change. I love you. I can't let you go like this. I love you, so you must change. That's always a safeguard against the perils and pitfalls of Satan that is kept in plenty along life's highway. It is not to be mourned, but if you waste your life, if you waste your life just because you refuse to listen to some godly counsel, it's a colossal and eternal waste. You are standing in the presence of God's people in the midst of this congregation to receive this personal and practical exhortation. Get someone with whom we can really fellowship and communicate and who will put his hand underneath you when you are about to sing and before you reach the rock bottom to lift you up. God bless you. Please now. There was one Hananiah. There was one Azariah. There was one Mishael. They gave tension and strength and encouragement and support to each other so they were able to stand before a lion like king and say, in this matter, we know our God will deliver us. Even if he does not. Even if he does not. How did he get that audacity? How did they get that kind of an assurance? That is the strength of fellowship. The three were together. So, Jesus, the fourth young man, joined them together. In fire, they were again together, tied together. Before the fire, without tying, they were together. The king only helped them to still stick close in their fellowship. The three young men were thrown into fire, and the fourth young man was walking with them. The Bible says, the fourth one is like the son of man. Us for obeying him or walking a walk of obedience is four runners. Four runners. Obedience is taught as well as caught. Say that again. Obedience is taught as well as caught. Jesus is the supreme example of obedience. He is for number number one. Third chapter, first two verses. Therefore, holy brothers, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider, look at, observe the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. Observe him. He is our forerunner. He was faithful in all the house of his father. The obedience of Jesus Christ was not intermittent, it was consistent. The Bible says, he was co-equal with God, 
but he did not consider it a robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. He humbled himself. How long? Not just for one week or two weeks. Until death. Amen? Amen. I like that phrase. He humbled himself and he was obedient until death. And then the very next word says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Forerunner. We should not immediately say, oh, Christ could obey God, the Father in everything because he was the Son of God. But remember, he was also the Son of Man. The Bible says in that matter of obedience, who came in the likeness of man and obeyed his father. You get that? That is why that emphasis comes there. We have got other forerunners. Noah obeyed God amidst mockers. 11th chapter, 7th verse. Noah obeyed God amidst mockers. 11th chapter, 7th verse. Abraham obeyed God, leaving comforts. Abraham obeyed God, leaving comforts. 11th chapter, 8th verse. Joseph obeyed God against allurements. 11th chapter, 22nd verse. Moses obeyed God against affluence. 11th chapter, 24th verse. Daniel obeyed God against threats. The disciples obeyed God amidst persecutions. Ha, therefore, brethren, we are surrounded with a cloud of witnesses. Hallelujah! Hallelujah. There's a logic he builds up there. All these are foreigners. They have done their part. It is a relay race. They have finished their portion. Now the baton is passed on to us. We are in the last dash. And they are just saying, up, 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 up. They are whistling. Cloud of witnesses. And we are going to complete it. If we are slack and slow, sluggish and we are slumbering, all their efforts will be wasted. We are the last of the last generation. We are perhaps the penultimate generation. Not only in the scriptures, we have in church history also, we have foreigners. Amy Carmichael obeyed God's call and she came to India. William Carey obeyed God's call and he came to India. David Livingston obeyed God's call and he went to Africa. Adonai Anderson obeyed God's call and he went to Burma. Hudson Taylor obeyed God's call and he went to inland China. Sadhu Sundar Singh obeyed God and walked with bleeding feet all over India. Mary Slessor obeyed God and she went to work with cannibals. Graham Staines obeyed God and died in Orissa. Will you follow this army of the obedience? Let come what may, I want to obey God. Read the Bible and the biographies of these missionaries. If you keep on watching your television too long and reading the newspapers too long without spending enough and even more time with the scriptures, with the Bible and with the biographies of men and women who obeyed God, you will be imbibed with the spirit of the disobedience which is now working among the sons of disobedience. That is why we should be very careful about the dosage of obedience versus disobedience we take in. Are you with me? Do you follow what I'm saying? The sixth help God gives us to obey Him is failures. Failures. 
There is no one without failures in the world. <laughs> Praise God for that. But the glad news is, no failure is final. Especially for God's people, no failure is final. All failures can be redemptively used for some educational purpose. 12th chapter, 9th verse. 12th chapter and 9th verse. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of Spirits? Readily be in subjection. That is the attitude of obedience. And here is a chapter which deals entirely with chastisement. Even about the Lord Jesus Christ, we read in the 5th chapter, verses 8 and 9. 5th chapter, 8 and 9. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who? To all who? Are you able to see how this theme is unfolding in this entire book? In the case of Jesus Christ, there was no failure, but it was suffering. It was suffering. That is why David testified in the 919th chapter. There is a dispute whether it was David or anyone who wrote that psalm. But we would say the psalmist says in the 119th chapter, verse 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I keep your word. Before I suffered, I went astray. But now I keep your word. Not only that, Look at the 71st verse of the same 119th chapter. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, disappointed, disgusted, frustrated, failed, suffered. For what? That I may learn your statutes. Some of you here are wondering and worrying, why God allowed this storm in your life? Inexplainable. No fault of yours. There could be only one reason. God loves you. He loves you too much. He wants you to learn more and more of his word and of his ways. Friends, failures bring us to our knees. And repeated failures make us prostrate. Failures are God's attention getters. When everything goes all right, we become casual. But when God allows a failure in our life, yes, Lord, what's that you want to tell me? If you don't learn from failures, you are only learning to fail. Understand that. Disadvantages in life Failures in life usually keep us humble and obedient, submissive, meek and soft and lowly before God so that he will lift us up in his own time. Abraham Lincoln had a very difficult childhood. He studied formally in the school hardly for one year. He failed in his business in 1831. He was defeated for the legislature in the year 1832. He again failed miserably in his business in 1833. And his fiancée died in 1835. And he contested for the speaker and he was defeated awfully in 1838. He married a woman who became only a burden in his life. Of his four sons, only one of them lived up to 18th year of age. 
He contested for the Congress, he was defeated. He stood for the election of the Senate, there he failed. And again for Vice Presidency, he was totally washed out and defeated. But in 1860, he became the most celebrated and famous President of the United States. Failure is not final. God takes us through this crucible of the furnace of pain, agony, inexplainable things to keep us soft and stable under him so he would exalt us. So he would exalt us. So he would exalt us. I stress that word. So he would exalt us in due time. Seventhly and lastly, the help God gives us to walk in obedience to him is future. Future. What God has promised to those who obey him, if only we remind ourselves of that, that's the greatest motivation for our obedience. Fourth chapter, from verse 7 to 11. Fourth chapter, verse 7 to 11. He designates a certain day saying, in David, today, after such a long time it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Why? The answer is given. For, because. If Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. Jesus Christ was giving a long sermon on that mount which we call the Sermon on the Mount. And towards the end he spoke about obedience. Anyone who hears and does what I say, I will liken him to a man who has dug his foundation deep enough to lay it on a rock. Floods came, winds blew, Rains lashed, but that house stood firm. I want to just read one word and close this meditation. All of you take your Bibles to Deuteronomy 28th chapter. Deuteronomy chapter 28. I will read to you verse 13. Take this as a promise for your future if only you will choose to obey God. 28.13 of Deuteronomy. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You shall be above only and not beneath. If. Encircle that word, if. If you heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today and are careful to observe them. May I request all of you, please read, please, please take these words and we all will read it aloud in the presence of God as a confession that we accept what God has said about obedience. Deuteronomy 28 and verse 13. One, two. The Lord will make you head, not the tail. You shall be above only and not with you. If you heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command to you today, and are careful to observe. I just want to close with one thought. This word obedience in Tamil has got a very interesting meaning. The word obedience or obey in Tamil is called Kibari, which means the first ladder, the first step of the ladder. The meaning is there in the language itself. So I believe obedience is the first step in 
the ladder uh, going higher and higher. I like the way your pastor put it. Let's go deeper and higher. Unless you take the first step, you will not have the further steps and you will not reach the final step either. Shall we all stand up in the presence of God? Trust and obey for there's no other way to